My name is Laura Roberts Nkrumah, and I'm a retired member of staff of the Department of Food Production in the Faculty of Food and Agriculture at the University of the West Indies. I am happy to be sharing with you today on mango because it's mango season. And we are here at the University Field Station where we have a mango grove with a variety of mangoes so that I can share with you about mango varieties and utilization and a little bit on growing mangoes. We have a lot of mangoes all over Trinidad and Tobago. And so we may think that mangoes are indigenous to our part of the world. They aren't. Mangoes were introduced to the Caribbean. They came from Southeast Asia, where the two main areas of mango origin are India and the Indo-Chinese region that encompasses the Philippines and Thailand and places like that. And those two regions have given rise to two basic types of mangoes. Um, although there are thousands of different cultivars, these cultivars fall into two basic types, the Indian type and the Indo-Chinese type. When we talk about mango types, as we in Trinidad know, there are different varieties of mango. So we would know about mango ver, which means green mango. Sometimes it's called long mango. We also know about mango rose, and I'm sure some of you, particularly the older persons, would know that little folk song about mangoes. I will not attempt to sing it, but it gives us the names of a number of mango varieties, right? Dudu, Susumata, all right? Now, what it is about mangoes that give them that kind of variability? Well, mangoes come in a number of different sizes, and I have a collection of mango types here to just to give you an idea today. Now, mango is very in shape. It's one of the main ways in which we tell the difference between the varieties, apart from, of course, the color of the ripe fruit. Here we have a mango, and you would see that the basic mango fruit has a shoulder that gives us more or less how the stem is inserted into the fruit. Here it's almost flat, okay? Sometimes we can have a shoulder that slopes like in this one. Then the mango has width or diameter, and that gives you an idea of the thickness. So when we talk about the mango cheeks, as we would refer to this, we are talking about where most of the flesh on this mango is to be found, okay? And that gives us the width of the mango. But also, the mango has length, okay? And so again, we can see differences in length. So the way how the flesh is distributed on the fruit, all right, varies, and that is what gives us the shape. Another important aspect of the shape is the end or the apex, the base, or what we call the apex. Here, the apex is fairly rounded. If we were to look at this fruit, all right, we will see that the apex is pretty blunt, all right? Whereas, if we were to look at this one, we would see that the apex is pointed, and this is a characteristic of the Indo-Chinese type. Whereas, if we look at a gram, we will see that there is no beak at all, all right? It's practically round. And of course, Graham, look at the shoulders, nice and flat, big cheeks, okay? And a pretty rounded fruit. This manila mango is very similar in its shape to our mango there, that elongated shape, and it ripens yellow without the red blush of the Irwin. But we can also have 
mangoes like our Julie. All right. If you notice, the apex or base is more flattened. All right. It is not as round as this one. And also the fruit itself tends to be flatter. It doesn't have these nice full cheeks as this one or this one. Okay. So we have quite a range, as I said, in our, in our shapes. Now, the, so, the, so the Indian type, more color, more rounded, all right, brighter. And also, we find among the, so the, 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 the Indo-Chinese type, uh, the, the most representative would be like our mango ve, which does not ripen red. Okay, it has no red color in it. It tends to ripen either with this yellow green kind of color, or sometimes you know a mango there can be green, light green, but still ripe on the inside. And um, the other thing about those Indo Chinese types is that they tend to be Ill, more elongated in shape. And if you notice at the base, the base tends to have a little beak, okay? So it's more pointed, all right? And so you can think about what we would call in Trinidad, cutlass mango. Now, I just mentioned cutlass mango in Trinidad, and we would have types like zabrico, dudus, susumata, teen, starch, ice cream, <laughs> and the list goes on and on. How then do you tell mango types one from the other? As we said, color, shape, size, all right? And that sort of thing. But in terms of the names, you recognize that some of the names are really names after people. So when we say Julie, that is named after a person. I have something here called Graham. That is a person's name. Or if we have Irwin, that's the name of a person. Sometimes you can have the mangoes named after where they were collected, the person who collected it. They got those mango seeds from somewhere and so they may talk about Ceylon or Bombay, right? Manila is a type that is um, very popular in Mexico, but you notice the name is not Mexican. It's Manila, which is from the Philippines, okay? So, all I want to say is that there are thousands of mango types based on primarily selection, types that people favor. They have characteristic and somebody selected it and that mango might have been named after that person. And we also have types that would have been developed by breeding. Much of the breeding work taking place in India itself as well as in places like South Africa, Israel, um, Australia, and to a lesser extent, Florida. There's one thing to which I want to draw your attention. And this is the spots that we can get on mangoes, these spots. These spots are caused by a fungus called anthracnose. And we will talk a bit about that fungus more when we go to the field. But this is another characteristic of different mango varieties. Some types are more susceptible to this disease than others. You would notice here in this Bombay that we hardly have any spotting at all. All right. Whereas in others, um, we can have quite a bit of it. This Ceylon mango, we have very little of it, whereas in the Graham and um, sometimes also on our Julie, we can get a bit of it, all right? So that um, this is something that we look out for because it impacts the fruit quality. You know, it impacts fruit quality. If you go to purchase mangoes, you don't want to, you know, it's not, it's not attractive to have a lot of mangoes with those black spots. <clears throat> and um, if they remain there too long, 
then you find that those pots grow and they cause the fruit to deteriorate. So that even for processors, it is not a good characteristic because it can change as the fruit deteriorates, the quality of the flesh deteriorates. You can have off flavors also developing and um, that is not desirable, okay? Mangoes are beautiful fruits in terms of their taste and that is one of the things that they also vary in. All right, you get a range of fruits. So like in our mango, uh, ve. There is a strong turpentine taste, which we may appreciate, all right? We tend to like strongly flavored fruits. Whereas if one were to think about exporting something like mango ve, if you're going to an American or a European market, you will hear them complain that the mango is too strong. The, f the flavor is too strong. They prefer milder flavors so that if you are into commercial production, it is important to select your fruit for the market. Another aspect of selecting the fruit for the market is not just who is consuming it, but in what form. So again, if we are looking at something like um, utilization for Amchar, Amchar or for Kuchela and that sort of thing, then we are looking for different characteristics. Right? We look for a mango that is heavy bearing because you want to be able to, you know, su supply the mango at a good price to the processor. You look at types that are more fibrous. You look for types that, you know, have that bit of a stronger flavor so that what, by the time you add your spices and so you can still get some mango coming through, you know, like when you make your curry mango and, and, and that sort of thing. Whereas um, if you are looking for fresh consumption you look at mangoes that can transport well they have thicker skins they have a longer shelf life and so something like the grey mango that has a thick skin and you know tends to travel well um, so those are some things that one would look for in selecting mango for different uses and i just mentioned a number of different ways in which mangoes can be used for, for um, example, in the preserves, the anchar and the kuchala and so on. And um, we would also see a lot of red mango preserve on the market. But I should say that there, before we go to the preserves, um, there are other ways in which mango can be consumed. For example, they can have mango concentrate. The pulps being used for like um, fruit toppings, um, and also you can have fruit chunks uh, being preserved and canned or being used in ice creams and in yogurts, things like that, sorbet, all right? So um, there are a lot of ways that we can use mangoes. Even mango wine, it's a fruit and it would ferment. So um, that's another way mangoes can be used, but there's nothing to beat a good fresh mango where you can enjoy all of the complexities of the different um, mango flavors. Some more starchy than others. Some, the flesh is more fibrous. Others, the flesh is smooth, virtually without any sort of fiber at all, melt in the mouth kind of experience. And some of them may have little hints of a certain amount of spiciness, like there's one in Trinidad we call Buxton Spice, okay? And there are others, as I said, with a more turpentine flavor and so on. So there's a lot to explore in mango. It's a really, really great fruit and also good for us from a nutritional point of view. Mango, that beautiful color that it has on the inside of most of the varieties, particularly those that we have in Trinidad, that deep yellow to orange colored flesh indicates high vitamin A content. Okay, that's the carotene, which we know is an important antioxidant that um, fights a lot of uh, disease situations that, that we can be afflicted with. We also have in mangoes quite a high content of vitamin C. Um, it has been estimated that something like 67 to 70% of our daily requirement of vitamin C can be met from, you know, um, mango fruit, or like about 100 grams of fruit, 
will give us 67%, um, 70% of our vitamin C content. And we also know that in our society, we have certain lifestyle diseases like high blood pressure or hypertension, but our mangoes provide a high, content, a high content of potassium that is also useful for that. Now, I spoke about um, the nutritional value and um, the importance in relation to even some of our lifestyle diseases. I want to just say this as a little caution, or probably a big caution particularly to us older ones. Mango is also um, a source, a very good source of energy, particularly in the form of sugars. If one is quite active, you know, then you can have the two and three mangoes, or as I had in my childhood, I would put mangoes to stale. And so when I sat down to have mangoes, it was a little mango fest, and, you know, with a whole bucket of mangoes, I would not dare do any such thing at, <laughs> at this stage in my life. And so I just want to caution some of us, um, especially persons who might be diabetic or pre-diabetic, that you want to really look at how much you consume at one go, all right? Maybe just one a day, all right, and a small one. Or if you have a large mango like this, find a friend or a family member and share it, okay? <laughs> so you can have a slice and enjoy it. And tomorrow you look forward to a slice of the same or another type, okay? We started talking earlier on about different types of mangoes. One way in which mango types or varieties differ is in the size of the trees, when those trees come to maturity. One of the types that we looked at was the Graham mango. And we can see some Graham mango trees here on the side. These are quite tall trees. This is an important consideration. <clears throat> if you are growing mango in your home, right in your backyard, Graham is quite a large tree. And so you will have to think about whether you want to place a Graham mango tree in your yard because it means that from very early you will want to control it. I should just say that mango trees as a whole tend to be large trees. So one way in which the size can be controlled is when you choose the type of planting material to use. Instead of growing the plant straight from seed, what you would prefer is a grafted mango. Grafted trees come into bearing earlier and therefore they tend to be shorter than trees that come from seedlings. With the seedling trees, they take about four to five years to grow and then they come to maturity, flower and fruit. Whereas <clears throat> with the grafted plants, the rootstock is different from the scion or the top of the plant. So that the mango that you are going to be eating is going to be determined by the scion or the top. But that scion would have been taken <clears throat> in the nursery from a plant that is already mature. That is, that that plant is already in flowering and fruiting. And this is why the grafted plant comes to maturity earlier and bears while it is still smaller than the seedling plant. One thing I would like to draw your attention to, whether you are growing mangoes at home or uh, you are a commercial grower, and this is the environmental requirements for mangoes. If you notice, the fruits bear at the ends of the branches. Mango likes to have full sunlight, and full sunlight is very important for flowering and therefore bearing of the fruit. If the fruits, if the trees are too bushy or they have a lot of, of shoots on the inside, those shoots do not bear. Very important about that bushiness is that it encourages a high relative humidity 
within the canopy of the plant. Remember, I showed you fruits with that spotting, that anthracnose problem. You want to discourage a bushy canopy because a bushy canopy encourages high relative humidity, which promotes the incidence of anthracnose. So that is one way you can control anthracnose in the field. The other way is that you tend to keep, you will want to keep your drains or anywhere where the mango trees are being grown, you want to keep them free of water. All right, again, that's another way of encouraging <clears throat> a lower relative humidity within the field, as well as ensuring that there is a good airflow all right, wherever you are growing your mango trees, that also reduces the relative humidity, the dampness, and the incidence of the spotting. So those are two important things that I wanted to say to you about mangoes and um, where you grow them, how it affects the quality of the fruit. All right, so you, <clears throat> the other thing that is important is <clears throat> When mango fruits fall on the ground, we want to remove them as quickly as possible. Don't just leave them there. Two problems that have shown up, <clears throat> two insect problems in Trinidad and Tobago, mango fruit fly and mango seed weevils. If we remove the fallen fruits from the ground, it helps to break the cycle of infection with those insects. All right. If we leave the fruits on the ground, then the adults will simply emerge from those fallen fruits. They fly back up, they lay their eggs on the, on the fruits and the eggs hatch. The larvae or worms develop, they eat the um, flesh in the case of the fruit fly or they go right through to the seed in the case of the mango seed weevil and they eat that. Both insects lead to a deterioration of the fruit quality. So we don't want to have that. And one simple way is first of all to keep the insects out of the field, but just in case they are around as a, or as a preventative measure, don't encourage fallen fruits on the, on the ground. So you will take those fallen fruits up, take them away from your mango trees and you burn them or you dig a hole and you bury it. Okay. So we talked about the mango tree size. That's a large tree. And um, one of the ways, of course, in controlling size is to prune. Okay. Now, I would just say one thing about pruning, because this is not really, a, you know, a, a video on how to produce mango, how to grow mangoes. But I would just say one thing, particularly for homeowners. You want to start pruning your mango trees when they are still pretty young. And <clears throat> the first set of pruning, you want to make sure that the trees have an open canopy so that the light can get in. For the same reason that I mentioned before, to encourage flowering and fruiting. And even the light itself helps to check growth. The other thing is that um, when we prune, you want to time your pruning properly. Do not time your pruning in the mid middle of the rainy season, you know, like right after harvest in August, September. You choose to prune then. If you do, because we have a rainy season that continues well until December or even early January, the trees are going to start to flush again. They're going to start to produce new vegetative shoots, which will simply go carry the tree back up to the height that it was in when you pruned it. So the best time to prune is at the end of your rainy season when the tree is going into the, um, the drier period all right, of the year and you will tend to get more flowering at that time. Okay, we were talking about the height of mango trees and how it affects suitability for the home garden. The best choice that we have is the Julie mango. That is a natural dwarf and um, as such you would find that you have to expend less time pruning it. Julie mango trees are always grafted. When you purchase them at the nurseries they are always grafted plants. 
and that grafting also helps the dwarf characteristic. One of the other important uh, features of the tree that the grafting influences is the color of the fruit. You see these fruits that we have on this tree, you notice they have this reddish blush. That tells us that this tree was grafted onto the rose mango. The rose mango influences the color of the fruit by giving it this reddish blush. If the trees had been grafted on mango ve or mango long, they would ripen but with a more greenish yellow color. You wouldn't get this red blush, okay? The nice thing about having Julie mangoes as a tree in, the, um, in your backyard or, you know, at your home is that you get more than one bearing throughout the year so that there's always some fruit available and that is a nice feature. You know, you can get um, maybe three or four crops for the year. Uh, of course, the heaviest bearing is at this time, June, July. But, um, you know, it's all, you always have something to look forward to, particularly when you have periods of dry weather. You will see flowers emerging and in about three to four months, you have fruit. So, Julie Mango is a great one to go with. It is one also that you would want to control the height, but that is easier, as I said. One little note, because it is grafted it's an, and it's a natural dwarf, it tends to begin to flower, to flower, it tends to begin flowering very early. So you can have very small trees just out of the nursery, maybe just about a year old, and they start to flower. I want to encourage you to remove those early flowers. Allow the tree to get to a proper size that it can really carry the weight of the fruits. Okay? So, when you do that, <clears throat> the tree is going to be able to bear and give you a good yield. If it starts too young, then the production of fruit will stunt the growth so that you are not going to get as many, all right? And if it carries too many fruit, it may even kill your tree. So you don't want that. Allow it to get to a good height, you know, a good five feet or so, and then you will allow for the bearing. So enjoy your mangoes, right? Whether you have them growing at home or you have to purchase them, and we hope that neighbors who have mango trees will share. <laughs> So we have been talking mangoes, mangoes, and one may want to know what is my favorite mango. Well, it is a simple mango, but it is to me absolutely glorious. And that is mango starch. And I love mango starch simply because of the sensory experience. You know, there is such a range of it. There is that burst of flavor. There is that starchiness. You know, that, that sort of mouth feel that you get. And with every, I wouldn't say a bite because <laughs> the way I eat mangoes, I am eating right down to the seed. With every scrape, you know, of that flesh, there, there's just a range of flavor. It's sweet, it's tangy, it's starchy, it's glorious. That's the best way I can describe it. All right. <laughs>